I'm Bob, and with me is Jack, Senior Engineer at Allied Edison. Welcome to the Allied Edison ZX3 DC Ground Fault Detection and Location Equipment video. Jack, for more than 100 years, ungrounded DC battery systems have been relied upon to supply control power in various industries. Some of these include the electric power industry, naval, mining, telecommunications, wastewater, and petrochemical industries. But why are these DC systems ungrounded? The reason is simple, Bob. These systems supply control power to loads that are so vital for safe and reliable operations that they must remain energized at all times. These loads can include protective relays, control relays, breaker trip and closed functions, pumps, motor solenoids, valves, electronics, and a host of others. Therefore, an operating facility cannot afford to trip on a DC ground fault. Instead, they would typically receive an alarm notifying the system operator of a ground fault. What typically happens when a system operator receives a DC ground fault alarm? That is an excellent question. In my opinion, there are three options available to the operator. Number one, because a ground has been historically so difficult to find with contemporary equipment, many system operators classify the alarm as a nuisance and simply ignore it. Number two, system operators can classify the ground as something to look for when more time or resources are available. Number three, a system operator can dispatch a technician to attempt to locate the ground fault immediately. Which do you think is the best option to maintain reliability of the station? An operator should always choose option three because if a second ground should occur, the consequences could be severe. The alarm is sent to alert the operator that action is required immediately. How the operator responds to the alarm could be a defining moment for the station. Jack, a second ground sounds like it could adversely affect the reliability of the station. What are some of the things that can happen if a second ground occurs before the first one is located? That's correct, Bob. DC system reliability could definitely be in question. Let's have a look at some simplified branch circuit examples to get a grasp of what can happen. In the first example, an unintentional ground has occurred between a controlling contact and a field device. A controlling contact could be a relay contact or a switch such as a temperature, vibration, level, flow, pressure, or hand switch, etc. The field device could be one of many different types of loads, but for this example, let's say it is a 230 kilovolt breaker closed coil, this single ground would have virtually no effect on the control circuit. The station DC system ground detector would sense the ground occurrence and send an alarm to the station operator. The station operator would react according to the three options that I mentioned earlier. However, if a second ground occurred on the positive rail before the first one was located and cleared, the controlling contact is now bypassed because a new current path was formed through ground. Our 230 kilovolt breaker could close on its own. I believe that it is also important to note that the second ground could occur on any positive rail of the DC system and cause the same effect. It doesn't have to be just on the positive rail of the affected branch circuit. If the field device was our 230 kilovolt breaker trip coil, the breaker could false trip, disrupting transmission. Of course, the second ground could come in on a negative rail so that the field device is now bypassed through ground. As soon as the controlling contact is closed, a short circuit is formed between the positive and negative rails. This has the potential of tripping the branch circuit feeder breaker on overcurrent and removing control power to our 230 kilovolt breaker, making it unable to close. A trip of the branch circuit feeder breaker would cause a loss of control power to all loads on the branch circuit. It is also important to note that the second ground could occur on any negative rail of the DC system and could cause two branch circuit feeder breakers to trip. If the field device was our 230 kilovolt breaker trip coil and the controlling contact was a protective relay, the breaker could fail to trip during a fault. Also, a first ground can occur between cells of a battery bank or solar panels in an array. When the second ground occurs on a rail, the ground will most likely burn itself clear, but could damage the battery system during the fault. Or a second ground could occur ahead of a field device, supply a reduced voltage to it. However, it could be enough voltage to inadvertently pick up the field device. A ground can develop in the turns of an electromagnetic coil, such as a solenoid valve or a relay coil. 
Also, these are only simplified depictions. The reality is that each branch circuit can have multiple field devices, multiple controlling contacts, both of which can be in a series or parallel combinations. Since there are multiple branch circuits on a DC system, there are endless number of possibilities. A second ground occurring after a first ground alarm has been received could be a very bad day indeed for the station. Wow, Jack, I can see where a second ground could cause absolute havoc on a station or a power system, possibly causing prolonged downtime, safety issues, major equipment damage, major financial losses, and a multitude of other problems and concerns, all of which could have been avoided by locating the first ground before a second ground could come in. But will the system operator always get when the first ground occurs? Not necessarily. The grounds that I showed in the simplified examples are called solid grounds, which are virtually a short to ground. However, grounds can have a resistance associated with them also. If the first ground was of high enough resistance, there may not be enough current flow back to the station ground detector to see it and alarm. This undetected ground can remain until another more solid ground occurs. Eventually, as grounds continue to occur, there will be enough current to alert the system operator. This situation is what we call a multiple ground issue. Knowing system resistance values can be very useful data in analyzing the specific condition. You can have high resistance, all positive or negative multiple grounds, or a combination of high resistance positive and negative grounds before you actually get the alarm. Each new ground draws a little more current until the station ground detector reaches its alarm threshold. So, should a system operator be concerned with a high resistance ground that just crosses the alarm threshold of the station ground detector versus a ground that crosses the alarm threshold solidly? Definitely. A system operator should react to the alarm in the same manner by immediately commencing with location efforts. A ground that contains resistance can become more solid in an instant, depending on its nature. The ground could also become more resistive but a system operator should always default to the most conservative approach and attempt to find the ground. What are some of the common causes of these grounds, Jack? There are an infinite number of causes, Bob, but some of the most typical are nicked wires, insulation that has worn away due to vibration, water intrusion, especially in ground insulation, or systems that are exposed to the elements, poor quality components, maintenance practices, surrounding faults, etc. Okay, Jack. I think I have a pretty good grasp of why it is of the utmost importance to locate the first ground before the second ground comes in. How can the first ground be located and what are the hazards found during the location effort? There are two options available to the technician attempting to locate the ground bomb. The first option is called the breaker isolation method. This method requires extensive research into what field devices are being fed by each branch circuit, how they are being controlled, and what are the ramifications if they lost power. Temporary modifications may have to be employed to maintain circuit integrity. A strong electrical background, print reading skills, as well as current prints are required. The second option requires the use of portable detection and location equipment. The idea being that the equipment is functional and reliable under any condition and a technician skilled in its use can locate the ground without disturbing the branch circuit or DC system. So Jack, which option is the best and why? The breaker isolation method is very time consuming when time could be critical. It also could introduce mistakes and put the system at as much risk as the grounded condition itself. The use of ground location equipment is definitely the preferred method for numerous reasons. With the right equipment, Risk is reduced. The location is accomplished much faster, safer, and non-intrusively. Are there any other adverse ground conditions other than solid or resistive ground faults and multiple ground faults? Unfortunately, there is one more type of ground fault that is almost impossible to find, intermittent or cycling faults. A system operator could experience a condition where a ground alarm has been received and he subsequently dispatches the technician to locate it. The technician connects his locating equipment only to find the ground fault is no longer in. Intermittent faults can be some of the hardest grounds to find. So Jack, I have learned that the system operator should dispatch a technician to attempt to locate the ground the moment the alarm comes in and to use ground detection and location equipment to find it. I have also learned that intermittent ground faults can be the most challenging to locate. Are there any barriers or obstacles encountered by the location equipment that could jeopardize the success of the ground location effort? Yes, indeed. Capacitance on a DC system is the enemy of contemporary location equipment. 
How the equipment functions in a capacitive environment can mean the difference between marginal equipment performance and great equipment performance. Long cable lengths can create straight capacitance, power line filters can install capacitance to ground, and some of the circuit components can introduce capacitance. Capacitance can be on one or two circuits or be distributed throughout the DC system. Can the ground fault test equipment itself cause any of the scenarios previously mentioned, Jack? There are several operating experiences where substandard ground fault location equipment and techniques actually caused unplanned operations ranging from starting pumps, such as a reactor coolant pump motor, to inadvertently closing breakers, such as generator output breakers several degrees out of phase. Well, that would certainly add to the bad day at the station if the location equipment being used to locate the first ground actually caused the event it was being used to prevent. Naturally, the station would want to use the best equipment available that can provide as much data about the ground as possible and successfully and quickly find the ground. Indeed, Bob, most of the equipment on the market is designed using technology from the 70s or 80s. Most function only marginally and provide either no data, useless data, or very limited data for analyzing the ground condition. With regards to operation in a capacitive environment, most are non-functional and several are manufactured and sold by foreign countries. Their prices range anywhere from $3,000 to $15,000. Until now, the choices were very limited. What do you mean by until now? 